Nightcast. Stephen Lloyd Gilbreth brings you the current news from the world today and how it relates to Bible prophecy. Understanding the end time events leading to the peaceful world tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, Stephen Lloyd Gilbreth. Good evening, friends, and welcome to the September 8, 2014 edition of Nightcast. I'm going to open up, friends, tonight with uh, something I think at least a lot of you ladies will find to be good news, exciting, wonderful news in a world that is filled with a lot of trouble and chaos. Prince William says he and his wife Catherine are thrilled at the fact they are expecting their second child. The news was announced earlier than planned because, as with her first pres uh, pregnancy, the Duchess is suffering from very acute, you'll hear this in this video, very acute morning sickness and was unable to attend a public engagement. Other members of the royal family have expressed their delight at the news which has made headlines around the world. Nicholas Witchell has the honor of having tonight's opening good news report. William was there at a long planned visit to Oxford today, but Catherine couldn't make it, and Kensington Palace realized that it would have to explain the reason for her unexpected absence. She was pregnant with the couple's second child, the palace said, but suffering from acute sickness. So William was asked, how was she feeling? Uh, she's feeling okay, thanks. It's, um, it's, been, uh, it's been a tricky few days, a uh, week or so, but obviously we're immensely thrilled. It's great news. Um, early days, but I'm hoping we just things settle down and she feels a bit better. But uh, it's important that we all focus on the, the, big, the big news and the big international and, and domestic things that are going on at the moment. So um, that's where my, uh, my sort of thoughts are at the moment. I'm going to go back and look after her now. In December 2012, early in her pregnancy with George, doctors hospitalised the Duchess for a couple of days. On this occasion, with this pregnancy yet to reach the 12-week stage, it's hoped the sickness can be managed at home and that it will pass relatively quickly. George was a summer baby, born in July last year. The chances are that his younger brother or sister will be due in the spring, perhaps next April or May. He or she will automatically become fourth in line to the throne, fulfilling William and Catherine's obligation to ensure that the line of succession is secure. The Queen, seen here at the Braemar gathering near Balmoral at the weekend, is said to be delighted at the news, as is Uncle Harry. But would he be offering any advice on how to cope with an older brother? I don't think that, uh, there's never a strategy. I think George. I think George will be over the moon. He'll be thrilled um, having a, another smaller, younger brother, sister. So um, yeah, we'll, we'll wait and see. The family, the family continues to grow, and of course, with that growing family, your prospects of becoming king reduced, don't they? <laughs> Great. <laughs> Breaking right now, the second royal baby on the way. News of the pregnancy is making headlines around the world. Another royal baby is on the way. The international fascination with Britain's royal family shows no sign of abating. And what of the mother-to-be? Well, in rather less than two weeks' time, Catherine is due to make her first solo overseas visit to Malta. It hasn't been cancelled. I'm told the situation is being assessed on a day-to-day -day basis. Nicholas Witchell, BBC News, at Kensington Palace. All right, thank you for that opening, pleasant, delightful, good news. And now, friends, we'll go on into some of the uh, news that relates to the second seal of Revelation, that red horse that Jesus Christ described in plain language in Matthew 24, Luke 21, as war and rumors of war and that kind of thing. Some of the detail that relates to um, how some more war will be playing out in the, in the future days comes out of Iraq, where its parliament, Iraq's parliament, has approved a new government with Sunni and Kurdish deputy prime ministers as it seeks to tackle Islamic State IS militants who have seized large parts of the country. Salah al-Mutlaq, and Hashgar Zabari were approved under a power-sharing deal after weeks of political deadlock. The BBC's Jim Muir says that Sunnis will be keen to see that they are empowered by the new administration. 
Well, for the Americans, uh, absolutely vital because uh, has, had there not been uh, an inclusive or at least a nominally inclusive Sunni uh, involvement in this new government, um, they would find themselves basically acting as the air force for uh, Shiite militias uh, because that's what's been happening. And uh, if they wanted to continue driving into Sunni areas, they'd find themselves in a very sectarian situation. So the hope is that uh, this uh, new government, which does have Sunnis on board, it's brought the Kurds back in. Both of them, uh, Sunnis and Kurds, have been uh, pulled out of Nouri al-Maliki's outgoing government, accusing him of sectarian policies and uh, basically um, monopolizing power. Um, they're back, both back in, but the Kurds are saying that they're there for three months and then they'll see if all their grievances haven't been met, then they may pull out and they want actually paying within a week because they haven't had their share of the budget for nine months now and there's no cash in Kurdistan. So um, they've all got their conditions and the Sunnis will be uh, looking to see that this government uh, actually does carries out uh, what it said it will do or what it's hinted it will do, which is to give more power to the provinces, basically to empower uh, the Sunnis. Sunnis, so they feel they're, they're, they're part of this process and not excluded as they felt under Nouri al-Maliki. So it's going to take some time before that feeling gets through on the ground and actually wins Sunnis away from the uh, radicals of ISIS or the Islamic State, who in a way have been a vehicle for general Sunni grievances against the Shia-dominated system in Baghdad. Okay, friends, and uh, by the way, I just noticed that when I pulled the horses big on the screen that the lower third is showing the incorrect date. We're going to have to fix that, so I won't use the... I only have a couple more stories tonight. We've got a light night. I'm still in a recovery stage from uh, whatever it was that was causing me to have a stomach problem over the weekend and uh, do some throwing up, so it um, slept me a little bit weakened, but... Uh, we're going to cover the major points tonight. And our next story related to the second major crisis worldwide right now that's going on that could help either one of these, this Islamic State thing we were just looking at or this other major crisis in the world could have a lot to do with helping the United States of Europe that we're looking to come together in a certain way that will give its power to one dictator head, one emperor, new Holy Roman emperor of a revived Holy Roman Empire that will be the head of a system that the Bible calls the beast and the image of the beast. And either one of these things could help pull that together along with something else I'm going to mention before we close tonight. But the other, the other thing that could pull this together beside the Islamic State situation in the Middle East is the Ukraine situation in Europe. Russia today has warned that it, and the, you know, this could affect some of you who watch this program, who in just um, September 25, where are we now? It's, uh, t uh, September 25 is the next holy day. That's Feast of Trumpets. Nine days after that, Day of Atonement. Five days after that is the Feast of Tabernacles begins. So uh, we're talking about in October, October 9. So not that far away, the Feast of Tabernacles. Some of you will be flying to destinations perhaps around the world. This story could very much affect you. Russia has warned that it could block international flights through its airspace if the EU goes ahead with new measures over the Ukraine conflict. The European Union says new sanctions against Russia should be adopted shortly and would take effect tomorrow on Tuesday. Steve Rosenberg has this report. I'm not holding back at all and, and threatening uh, to close Russian airspace if the EU went ahead with, with further sanctions. So that, in effect, would mean that um, if European airlines are flying to Asia through Russia, they would have to go around Russia. So that would mean a huge detour. That would make for longer journeys, more expensive journeys. And uh, Mr Medvedev made it clear he thought that that would lead to the bankruptcy of a number of Western airlines. Uh, he also said that uh, Western sanctions would not lead to peace in Ukraine. And he named China as an example of a country 
which also faced Western sanctions going back to 1989, but which didn't change its political course. So his message very clear, Russia uh, wouldn't change its political course um, as a result of Western sanctions. But, of course, there is this window left open by the EU saying that if Russia does reverse its position in Ukraine, then these new sanctions or the threat of these new sanctions uh, could be rolled back. That is true. But I have to say it's seen here uh, in Moscow as a very small window. When you talk to Russian officials, Kremlin officials, they truly believe that the West has got it in for Russia. Uh, and uh, you get the feeling that trust has broken down completely between the Kremlin and the West. It, it appears that President Putin doesn't really trust Western politicians, and the feeling is mutual. Uh, the EU, the United States, uh, there's very little trust of, uh, of, the, of the Russian authorities. And in that atmosphere of a lack of trust and a lack of communication too, it's very difficult to find a way out uh, of this crisis. Friends, and uh, for our last story tonight, I'm doing a very short report tonight. I've got one that will hopefully help help us as we pray, as Jesus Christ instructed us to do, to be praying, to be watching world news, and to be praying about it, putting our hearts into it, becoming an active part in this next video. Uh, I believe this is going to help you, uh, help all of us put some teeth, heart, gut into our prayers tonight <clears throat> because, um, well, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just going to give it to you and show you, show it to you and see, uh, you, you take it as it, as, 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 as you will. And I hope it'll help you pray a little more fervently. Oh God, thy kingdom come despite the ceasefire in Ukraine, the number of children killed during the conflict has risen to 23. Before the truce came into place, pro-Russian separatists made big gains in Eastern Europe and seized territory a few miles outside of Maripol. Maripol is the last city in the Donetsk region still held by the Ukrainian government and is a strategic port on the route to Crimea, the, the peninsula annexed by Russia in March. Fighting in eastern Ukraine has left some 2,600 people dead, 2,600 people dead since April, uh, including some children that were killed during the truce. Fergal Keane has this very, very heart-wrenching video report, friends. This is where war leads, to Tatiana at the coffins of her children, to the neighbors who watch them grow up. The family want the story of Carolina, age six, and her disabled brother Nikita, ten, to be known. Shellfire killed them both on the day the ceasefire was declared. That afternoon in hospital, we'd met their grandmother, Lubov Vasilyevna, who was with them when they were killed. They lived in no man's land, between the shellfire of two armies. Nikita was born disabled. He couldn't speak properly or write or feed himself. I had to feed him, she told me. Karolina was nearly seven. She always helped me with everything. Today, from hospital to funeral, Lubov asked the same question again and again. She cried, God, why have you taken them? Twenty-three children have died in this war. Like Nikita and Karolina, they lived in places where land became something men were willing to kill for. Children faced death and displacement with their families, driven to makeshift camps like this old Soviet-era holiday resort. The propaganda pictures of forgotten heroes yellowing outside the bunk rooms. The war has distorted their lives, disrupted normality. I want to go home, but there's no home to go to, she says. A shell wrecked our house. In 
In the crowded bunk rooms, medical aid is being provided, including the help of psychologists for traumatized children. They have been traumatized, of course, by the conflict. You know, hearing shellings and bombs, uh, fleeing their homes, not being in their uh, normal environment has a huge impact on the, psychologic, uh, on the psychology of those, of those children. It's a serious situation for those displaced people. But if the conflict continues, this will worsen, definitely. The ceasefire is supposed to end the random cruelty that destroys the lives of children like Nikita and Karolina. But for their parents, it is a truce empty of meaning. Fergal Keane, BBC News, outside Mariupol. Friends, if you were able to watch that without a, a tear in your eye, then perhaps if you're watching live, you better go find this in the video archive and watch it again because uh, we need to be softened up to things like this going on in the world. And remember that Jesus Christ wept when he looked at the conditions of going on in some of the areas around him. And some of you have been asking, I've seen some of the things on social media where some, even among those who fellowship with us, have been asking, why can God allow, like the woman here was asking, why has why's God allowed this kind of thing to happen? Well, as Mr. Herbert W. Armstrong well explained it, when Adam and Eve ate of the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden, they cast upon all mankind a fate of deciding for himself, for man, all, for man deciding for himself what's right, what's wrong, instead of eating off the tree of the life where we would be given what's right and what's wrong by God. And those who are called now and those who can read and understand his word can, can know what's right, what's wrong. But man still has, Satan is still on the throne of this world as the God of this world. And God has allowed man 6,000 years to go his own way. And that's kind of a punishment for what our forefather Adam and and, and his wife Eve uh, did for us when they put us under sin. Friends, that's it for this Monday night report. I'm cutting it very short. God willing and the creek don't rise. We'll be back tomorrow night, Tuesday night. I'll have a special report, hopefully video. If not, I'll at least read you the report I have on how Germany is becoming the biggest military uh, power in Europe because it's of the amount of money it's going to be spending on its military. Surprising, surprising. Just 25 years ago, Germany, the wall fell that allowed Germany, between East and West Germany, allowed the reunification of East and West Germany. And now it's going to have the biggest military power. You know, all of that happened. The 25 years ago when the wall fell happened after Mr. Armstrong died. If he were alive today to see the reunification of Germany and to see the news that Germany will now have the biggest military budget of any country in Europe. Um, and if men only could understand prophecy, I was going to say, if he were alive to see that, he would, uh, he would be a gasp and, and wonder about the stupidity of the governments that fought against Germany in World War II. And why don't you remember World War I, World War II, lessons from history. You don't let that kind of an enemy rebound and have the biggest army military budget in Europe. We'll cover more on that tomorrow night. God willing, Creek Don't Rise. We'll be back Tuesday night with the day's current news related to the Bible and prophecy here on Nightcast. Until next time, friends, your host, Stephen Lloyd Gilbreth, saying so long and good night. have been watching Nightcast with Stephen Lloyd Gilbreth. Nightcast can be seen Sunday through Thursday nights here on COGTV.org. Tonight's program is also available anytime on demand in the COGTV.org video archive.